today is the 28th of August 2020 and um, I had a busy day but I wanted to read a chapter because I peeked at the title this morning and I thought oh that's a good chapter. The book is a prelude to the landing on planet earth it's written by Stuart Holroyd and I have been reading the sleeve notes and the foreword and everything in the previous chapters I finished with chapter four, obviously, uh, and uh, this is uh, an, a fascinating book about a group, uh, uh, a scientist, Dr. Puharic, a uh, doctor, a doctor and scientist actually, and an aristocrat and a Nubian, and they have been called by a group of extraterrestrials to help planet Earth uh, in its evolution. So, this was published in 1977, we are now in 2020, and it has been a labour of love for me to read these books, because I've also read The Only Planet of Choice, because I love it. So, I will simply read, and I hope you have a good Friday. Chapter 5. Encounters with the Opposition. Dr. Neil Hitchin is a pseudonym we will use for an acquaintance of Andridge's who have had an interest in his work for many years. Formerly a leading political figure, Dr. Hitchin had more recently spent several years in education. He had begun his career, however, in the ministry. So when he and his wife, Alice, paid a visit to Osinin and participated in some communications, it was natural that the subject of Christianity and the church should come up. Recalling that in a recent communication, Tom had said that there was a time 2,000 years ago, when the Earth was ready to make the evolutionary change now being attempted. And Richard asked if the time referred, referred to was the period of Jesus Christ. This is correct, Tom answered, but we do not call him Jesus Christ. We call him the Nazarene. He was one of us. His inspirational work and healings were inspired by us, and his energy was supplied by us. We had great hopes at that time, but then you made a god of him, as you have made a god of many. This will not happen this time. There will not be one, but there will be a collection of beings who will raise the consciousness of this planet. There are many on earth who expect the return of the Nazarene, Andrija said, but I gather from what you say that this is not possible. Tom said, a single individual will not return. There are many of you on this planet that are similar to the Nazarene. It is very important that you, do, that you do not deify us. It is important that you understand that God is in each and every one of you, that God is love, and it is love that creates one God. Neil Hitchens said he would be willing to help in any appropriate way and was wondering whether he should go back into the religious sphere, for instance by accepting an offer of the presidency of a university with religious affiliation. Tom said emphatically, no, with them you can only go though so far, because of the indoctrination they have had over 2,000 years. Neil then asked if his political connections would, could be of any use to the project. For instance, he could speak to people in the new president's entourage and possibly to President Ford himself. In response to this suggestion, Tom said, We have found in the past that when you tell people the truth, they feel threatened, or feel that it cannot be so. But it is in their thought, and they come to you. But if it is in their thought, and they come to you, they readily accept. We are grateful for your offer to help this project. You are in a position, more than any of these beings, to help with contacts and credibility. You must walk softly and with patience, and you must drop the seed. Neil and Alice, Tom said, had been under observation for some time. We have been around you many times, he said, and you have thought us spirits. But we are not spirits. Spirits are those that have passed on in this world and are hanging around this planet Earth. The spirits of this world that are in the atmosphere and around the bands of this world are as confused as the physical beings on this planet Earth. There are those that are evolved, but most are not. 
We are trying to save this planet Earth so that these spirit beings also may be released and be evolved. The Hitchens were also told that they had been together in two previous incarnations. No specific identities were mentioned. However, so that they did not have the difficulty and embarrassment that other participants in the communications were later to have of being asked to believe that they were famous people in their previous life. At the beginning of the next extended series of communications held at Osimin after Asigioli's death, Tom volunteered some information which will be as challenging for the reader as it was for John and Richard and Philip, and no doubt will cause some to conclude that the communications must be contaminated by the unconscious of one or other of the participants. Recalling the 20th July celebration and what they had learned about their roles at that time, Tom said he would now like to have the explanation one step further. It was very important that they should now understand their special relationship to the Nine. The Nine of us are in the area that you call the Zone of Code. The three of you are here on this planet Earth. Now, visualize as we are speaking to you of what is transpiring. Around each of you beings, there are three other beings, which are three beings of the nine. This makes you then the center as three of the nine surround each of you. This then feeds and nourishes and sustains you, who in turn sustain us, because without you three beings, we cannot accomplish what is needed on this mission. You cannot be replaced. Do you understand? We are honoured, Andrija said, but it's difficult to understand. Tom said that there were also problems of understanding on their side. The difficulty we have is in understanding the problems you have in this gross, heavy, density world that, as physical beings, you must exist upon. This is creating problems for our project, but the project must continue, and its completion cannot be delayed. It would greatly help the project, Andrija said, if the management would provide them, as promised, some time ago, with a clear statement of purpose and program imprinted on magnetic tape, so that in future there should be no ambiguities arising out of their personal interpretations of the communications and understanding of the world. The statement had not yet been received, and Andrija now asked when they might expect it. This brought from Tom a rapidly spoken reproach. We have observed the great anxiety generating around all three of you beings waiting for the statement and program. We have actually at times given you part of the program before you asked, and at times after you asked. And you seem to be delayed by waiting for this program, as if you cannot go forward without it. We do not understand its importance or why you're waiting. When you already know why you are here, why are you coming and why are you doing this work with you? We understand that you would like to relay this statement to the rest of the world and that you feel that this would be something that should be given to the people and they would believe, but there are those that still would not believe. Do you understand? And Vija answered that they understood that, but the point was that each of them had a partial and personal understanding of the program and, and the philosophy, and, and they wanted a definite statement in order to give their group internal coherence. I'm sorry if we're transmitting anxiety, he said, but it's not a lack of, lack of face or leads to our anxiety. It is an anxiety to get ahead with the work. I hope you understand that. Tom said, I understand it because I'm the one that works most, most closely with all of you. But the other members do not understand. And Richard asked John to put his point of view to the council, and John said that there too was concerned that that he too was concerned that their understanding and the message of the program might be distorted in their individual interpretations, or even that the communications themselves might be distorted by the consciousness of the channel. Tom assured him that there were no distortions in the channel. Then Andrija asked if the council now understood their anxiety, saying, It is a kind of healthy anticipatory anxiety, anticipatory anxiety. 
I hope it has no negative connotations for you. Tom absented himself for about half an hour to consult with the council, then returned and said, let me explain to you their feelings. It is now the consensus among our group that the delay was brought about in giving this statement has now caused us to take a new look at why you want this statement. I know why you want it, but when we observe you, it is as if you have put down your plow and are no longer plowing the ground to plant the seeds because you're waiting for the horse to pull the plow. We are disturbed and the entire, entire council is disturbed because of your anxieties and because you're waiting only for a statement. You must understand that I am their spokesman, as I am also your spokesman, and I understand why you do what you do. I'm only rela relating to you the council's feelings. And Richard said that for his part, he didn't see the justice of the reproach that the work had struck. He, John and Phyllis had been working consistently for the cause in their different ways. Tom said, we did not say the work had stopped. We were speaking of within your mind. All three of you have thought that you could not really go forward until this statement had been completed. This is what we speak of. John conceded that it was true of himself, but and Richard continued to rebuke the reproach. I think what may have been interpreted as a kind of stoppage is, is really prudent on our part, he said. Our interest is largely in the economy of effort. We want to do the right thing. So it's in the spirit that we're asking for guidance, and in this spirit that we're asking for guidance. Tom replied to this after a long pause of consultation with a strong speech and the introduction of a shift of perspective on the problem, which virtually disposed of the question of the need for a statement and program. He said, you know this physical world better than we know it. We need your minds and we need your energies. We suggest that you know better than we in which directions you are to go. If we feel that anything you are doing will jeopardize the program, you will be made aware of that. We cannot lay out a complete formula for you and a direction. There are things that we try to help you with and there are things that we try to institute. In the past, we have made many errors with this, because from where we sit, it looks as if this may be possible or feasible, but then we find in your physical world, it is not always so. We do not understand your material world. So therefore, we have decided that only when we feel the program could be contaminated or disrupted, will we then step in. We will guide and direct you as much as we can. You can ask us if we feel you are going in the right direction or the wrong direction. But at the same time, you must realize that we do not understand this material world and physical thing that you exist with. You understand this. This is the error we made with Yuri Geller. We did not understand about the material part. Andre John John never did get their definite statement, but after this explanation, the lack of it ceased to be a matter of concern for they tended to regard themselves more as responsible partners in a project than servants of a cause now. On, on the 14th September, Tom brought up for the first time the sub subject of the opposition. Hitherto, Andrew G. and John had understood that the management's effectiveness was limited only by lack of human understanding and the necessity to maintain the principle of free will. But now it emerged that the problem was far more complex and more sinister than that. For there were strong and intelligent opposition forces at work, whose aim was to frustrate and undermine the project. And one of the ways they would operate would be by availing themselves of any opportunity to attack any member of the group. So it was particularly important, Tom said, for them to keep in good physical condition and have proper rest and nourishment for when the physical body is in a weakened condition and it is lacking your physical rest or sleep, your energy levels are then down. And at these times, other beings, other forces, other vibrations may interfere. And without your physical body, without your energies and without your mind, we cannot do the work. Do you understand? 
and which I said that they understood the general idea but were not clear about what was meant by other forces, other beings, other energies taking over. Tom elaborated. We have negative and we and as we have explained to you many times, we must reach a balance between the two. To be all positive is not right, and to be all negative is not right. But in this universe, we have those that are all positive or all negative, and this causes an imbalance. The mission of the three of you is to bring this planet into balance. This planet is weighed, and it's heavy, and it is what you would call a negative vibration. We discovered this many of you years ago, and this is why you chose, as we explained to you before, to, you chose to be funnel. Because of the unbalance in your planet, the negative forces have taken on power, and this has created the problem. Furthermore, Tom, Tom went on to explain, the forces of the opposition, the others, were going to be particularly active and dangerous, and until we pass the 22nd of your month of October, our project will not be removed from danger. It was imperative that the three should remain together for the next month until the crisis period was over. The nine would give all the projections they could, but Tom said, there are technical problems at this time and there will be difficulties. The powers of the opposition should not be underestimated. Be careful in your movements be careful of your electricity. Be careful with what is around you. If they remove this physical being, then they have nullified all our work. And if they removed one of you, it would be the same. This reminded Andrija of a harrowing journey he had had some days before, when he had driven to the airport to pick up Phyllis and John. And through no fault of his own, he had nearly been involved in an automobile accident on four separate occasions. One of them on the return journey when they were all three in the car. He asked if the experience was relevant to the situation under discussion. It was a warning, Tom said. This is going to be a very difficult time for us and for you. Part of the problem is the earthly imbalances of the three of you. We are sorry that we must bring these things to your attention, but we are at a critical time. When one of you becomes out of balance, then the negative feeds on your energy. They deplete and take from you. Tom now proceeded to point out the characteristic faults of each of them, which reminded, which rendered them particularly vulnerable. To John, he said, You can be out of balance by not listening at times. You can be out of balance by presenting a problem in anger before it starts. Then, when you are out of balance and you become angry or fearful, the more angry or fearful you become, the more they feed on you. John said he understood this, and Tom next addressed Andrija. Be very careful, Doctor, that you do not miss some points. We know that you have a tendency to check and check and check. This we appreciate and are grateful for, but at times also you believe too readily. You're very trusting. You have now had antenna added to you and you should use your antenna to feel the vibration. This reference to bioengineering performed upon him interested Andrea and Rija, because for approximately the past two months he had been troubled by generally itching and spots and rashes on his skin, and he had difficulty sleeping on account of excessive energy. He mentioned this, and Tom confirmed that it was because of the implants, which when functioning properly would serve to balance the physical body and at the same time at the senses. This is a new implant in you and we are adjusting it, he explained. It should be neutralized in a period of four of your weeks. Remember that the civilizations are technical and are not perfect. Tom now spoke about Phyllis. This being, our being's problem is doubt and not believing. This is good at times, but to constantly doubt everything create, creates an imbalance. Her problem is that she does not listen to what is being said inside because of the doubts and the fears that what is being received will not be correct. That is ego. You will talk to her about this ego. Andrew took this up and asked about Phyllis channeling. You know the degree of trance dissociation she has and how accurately your thoughts get through. 
Could you give us any idea how accurate the transmission is? Tom replied, it is the most accurate and refined that has been transmitted. And Britta said, but tell us how inaccurate it gets when her ego gets in the way and she starts doubting and fighting and etc. Tom said, it creates a problem and a frustration within the physical body and then we in turn get short-circuited. But what we would like to talk to you about more than about the transmissions, because we are mostly in control of the transmissions, is the impression received during the day. There are beings that arise in your world that we must get through. This being is also being used for that. She refuses to bring to attention some of the things that she feels because she fears there will be an error and then her ego would get bruised or that she should interpret it wrong. The ego must be removed. And Regis suggested that a way of dealing with this problem would be to have Phyllis keep notes of her impressions and then check them again future, against future events. To discover correspondences between her impressions and the events would give her confidence. John contributed the suggestion that Phyllis should find more time to listen to the tapes of the communications, for she had in fact heard very few of them. Both suggestions would help to an extent, Tom, Tom said, but neither would solve the main problem, which was that Phyllis could not always correctly analyse her impressions. John and Aditya could help by discussing them with her, for energy then would create so that it can become clarified. What they had to understand was that Phyllis's difficulty was not wanting to talk for fear of error, and then the ego being hurt. Aditya said, we'll try and get round that by notes and giving her a sense of confidence about what things to share and what not to share, just to avoid bruising the ego. Tom said, you are misunderstanding. You are concerned about bruising the ego. That is the problem at this time. Well, I understand that eventually she has to get rid of the ego, Andrita said, but in the interim, I think we should be careful about her ego. So long as she understands that sometimes she must conquer the sense of I and me and self. Tom said, you are misunderstanding what we say. He said in a tone of rather weary patience. John said that he thought he understood and would explain to Andrija afterwards and Tom accepted this, saying, we are reading you and we are sure that you are aware. John took the opportunity to put in a question about the bioengineering that had been carried out on himself, but Tom asked him if this was something he really needed to know at this moment, because if, it, if, if not there were more cosmic things to talk about. Tom, John said that in that case, they should certainly defer question, answering his personal questions. And Tom went on. As you know, our project is at a critical time. We know that as long as we can keep the energy balance between you, and we know that this will be done, and we have not lost hope, and we have not lost faith, as we know that you are not, and we are still joyous because of your commitment. But as you become more aware of what is transpiring, there are also those who will tempt you create problems for you, cause danger for you, in order for you to give up the project. This is not a test of faith, but it's a test of stamina. What may happen between now and your October 22nd, besides the danger of the being, Phyllis, is in, is that the three of you become so tired and so weary that you wonder if you can continue. It is not a test you're going through. There is no test, but it is your opponent that would like to see you fail. And Vita said, it's clear to me that we have to address ourselves to two classes of opponents. Those that we have on Earth, who I think we can recognize, and on the other hand, the negative cosmic forces. Could you say something about each of these forces that we have to contend with? They are one and the same, Tom said. Those that oppose you here are emissaries for those that oppose you in the cosmos. The cosmic civilizations that are in opposition feed on the negativity of this planet and of other planets. They are the civilizations that instill in the physical beings of your planet their greeds, their hates, their desire and their love of possessions. By doing this, they generate more power. If you understand what we have explained to you before, that the energy which is created then creates God, because the energy is love, then you also understand 
that the energy of greed, the energy of jealousy, the energy of desire also creates an opposing force. The opposing force is very powerful, is very strong physically because it has no morals, no ethics, because of what it is fed, because of what is fed to it. We know your question, how can we then bring it into balance? And the positive forces also can create a problem by being too naive. But the positive forces also believe that act principle of love, they can then bring into balance the negative forces. This is a great cosmic battle. This may sound very strange to you, but if the forces of dark win over the forces of light, then the soul of the individual will no longer be the individual soul, because it will then feed a gigantic power, but will have no free will. We're getting into deep waters, and I will and I feel that a few comments might be relevant here. There are readers who will have no doubt with the idea of the great cosmic battle between the forces of light and those of darkness, and there are others for whom it will be all too reminiscent of a Jehovah's Witness doorstep sermon. Again, some will find the idea of reincarnation easily acceptable, while others will regard it as baseless superstition or wishful thinking. And probably a majority of readers will find the idea of the existence of pure light beings endowed with intelligence, wisdom and insight, and of an intelligent and cunning opposition, difficult to entertain, may be pertinent, pertinent therefore, to draw the reader's attention to a few facts and arguments that may dispose him to regard these concepts of the cosmic battle, reincarnation and the existence of discarnate intelligences of both benevolent and malevolent disposition in a new light and to see some relation between them. The key concept which helps elucidate and interrelate not only the three ideas mentioned above, but also a great deal else in the communication is that thought is a field phenomenon. This is a concept familiar to any modern physicist and by now virtually accepted as axiomatic by the avant-garde of that profession, <laughs> but it has not yet been widely publicized or understood in our culture. I know of only one book written for the general reader in which the implications of the idea had been explored at all thoroughly. Edward W. Russell's Design for Destiny, the terms L field, field of life, and T field, field of thought, used in the following paragraphs are Russell's coinage. Though his book is inspired by the work of Professor Harold Sexton Burr of Yale University, whose book Fields of life, our links with the universe, is also recommended to the reader who is finding the credibility difficulties of the present material insufferable. Insufferable. <coughs> Long sentences. Any schoolboy who has played about with a magnet and iron filling, filings is familiar with the phenomenon of an electromagnetic field. A field, in the scientific sense, may be defined as an invisible and intangible force which has the property of being able to organise matter. A fundamental principle of modern science is that everything, from cells, seeds and atoms, to suns and astronomical black holes and white dwarfs, possesses field properties, electromagnetic or gravitational field properties. Another fundamental principle is that it is not substance, but organisation that is the basis of reality. The traditional scientific, the naive realist and the common sense view, views of reality tend to consider things more real and concrete than the relationship between them. Whereas modern physics has demonstrated that what distinguishes from each other the basic elements which are the components of all matter is their atomic structure the number and organization of electrons in subatomic space. And what distinguishes the different kinds of electromagnetic energy is the frequency per second of wave cycles. In other words, organization in time. The substratum of reality, then, is an invisible and intangible thing. Organization. Where there is life or substance, there is an organizing field. Physics tend to lead the way among the scientists, and the adaptation of field theory to biology has been slow. 
Although the 30 years of research work that Professor Byrd and his colleagues have put, have put in has demonstrated its relevance. The biologist Sir Charles Dobbs once pointed out that the whole of the protein in the human body is replaced in roughly 160 days and wrote that when one contrasts the great complexity of the protein molecule with the fact that millions of these substances are constantly being built up and disintegrated in the human body and moreover we build to precisely the same structure one cannot help but speculate about the controlling mechanism the controlling mechanism the controlling mechanism we now know is the L field the L field carries all the relevant information to enable the living organism to maintain its individual identity despite numerous changes in the material of which it is constituted L fields are non-material but they organize and control living forms and as Russell points out being non-material L fields cannot possibly be result of physical evolution and therefore it is not necessary to assume that they must have been designed or developed in association with the matter of this planet any more than an architect plans have to be drawn on the site. Furthermore since anything that can organize has to exist before what it organizes, human L field must exist before the body that they organize, and there is no reason to suppose that they cease to exist when the bodies die. Bodies die. They have organized, died, and decomposed any more than a magnet field ceases to exist when the iron filling it has formed into a pattern are thrown away. So field theory biology lends support to the concept of reincarnation. In a sense, we are reincarnated many times in the course of our normal lifespan. So we shouldn't have any difficulty with the idea that the L field that controls and organizes the several physical bodies we inhabit during our allotted span might occupy other bodies and other times or places. Moreover, as fields can travel immense distances at the speed of light, the other places need not be the planet Earth. L fields may be, to use Professor Burke's term, our links with the universe, the basis of our cosmic connection. In this context, we might recall Roberto Assigioli's enigmatic statement that there are 60 million souls in the universe and only 4 million of them are incarnated at the present time. The rest, we may surmise, exist as unattached L fields or in association with some other form of organization of matter and when we recall too that according to the relativity theory mass is convertible to energy and vice versa the idea of the existence of what Ambrita called pure light beings becomes plausible let's now consider the evidence for the existence of the T field that minds can create with each other independently of the channel of sense and that mind can interact with matter independently of the laws of mechanical cause and effect are facts established by physical researchers and parapsychologists over the past century to the satisfaction of all but a minority of diehard orthodox scientists. The evidence for telepathy, clairvoyance and psychokinesis has demonstrated clearly the fact that thought is a field phenomenon. More recently, biofeedback research has enabled interactions between the T-field and the L-field to, to be measured and observed. The work of Elmer Breen which he reported at the May lectures, has shown that people can generate a T-field that will slow their heartbeat or stop a wound bleeding if they are fed back through electronic circuitry information about these physiological states. Modern studies of memory, too, point to it being a field phenomenon. Brain psychologists today speak of memory molecules and envisage these as analog analogous to a holographic plates on which an immense amount of information can be stored in a minute space. The information remains constant, but the memory molecule itself does not. Like all the other protein molecules in the body, it is unstable and subject to decay. But neurosurgical experiments and observations of people suffering brain damage have shown that one part of the brain can take over the memory contents of another. So these contents must exist independently of the container, the brain cell. Experiments and observation too have established that memories are tremendously enduring. Old people recall in detail sometimes events of 
infancy. To be enduring and to exist independently of substance or spatial locations are properties of field phenomena. So memory functions affords us convincing evidence of the existence of the T-field. That T-field can travel great distances instantaneously is proved by both anecdotal and experimental evidence for telepathy or thought transmission. That they can attach themselves to material objects is suggested by the phenomenon of psychometry or object reading. Psychics can pick up from material objects impressions and information about people or events formerly connected with them, and many people who are not particularly physically gifted are sensitive to the atmospheres or moods of places or, or people, especially when these are charged with violence or negativity. In religious, magical and occult law, the world over, there are prescribed rituals for putting blessings or curses upon people or objects, i.e. for influencing them with a positive or a negative tea field. In the light of these considerations, some of the things Tom said in response to Andrew about the Nine's mode of existence are interesting. The statements we are what we think we are at the time. We are soul and we are energy are all consistent with the idea that the basic mode of existence of the communicators is the T-field. As we have seen, T-fields can interact with L-fields, which makes sense of the claim that extraterrestrials can manifest in various forms, including a human form, although they had evolved beyond the point of needing a physical body. Physical body. Cool, really tragic. <clears throat> the same rationale would explain the existence of the opposition, the other, the negative T field. As the human body is an aggregate of millions of fields of varying sizes and functions, all of which may come under the control of a dominant field force, giving the body as a whole a disposition towards health or disease. So a powerful cosmic negative field force might mobilize a body of subfields to work together negatively and thus constitute an opposition to the positive evolutionary force. But a cosmic situation of such a kind and of such proportion exists is attested not only by the Osinin communications, but by some of the oldest of the world's mythology. For instance, the ancient Zoroastrian myth of the cosmic contest between Ahura Mazda the principle of light, and Angra Mainyu, the principle of darkness. Mainyu, the principle of darkness. Of course, the problem with correspondence is always that one doesn't know whether to regard them as mutually corroborative, corroborative or to consider one derivative from the other. The Zoroastrian myth was influenced or was repeated in Judaism and Christianity, and as we get deeper into the mythic cosmological aspect of the communications, the correspondence with Judaic Christian traditions and beliefs become more prominent. Some will see the correspondence as evidence of truth and others will regard them as evidence that the conscious or unconscious minds of the participants have contributed to the material allegedly channeled. And I do not propose to attempt to arbitrate between these two basically subjective views of the matter here. The purpose of this digression has been to suggest ways of regarding the situation that was developing and some of the ideas that were emerging in the communication during these crucial weeks of September and October in 1974. I have tried to show that neither the situation nor the ideas were inherently implausible. The thing I can help the reader with is the implausibility that this particular trio of human beings were involved in this cosmic situation, the suspicion that there is a touch of megalomania in the idea of their unique destiny, or of paranoia in the idea that they should be subject to the attention of the cosmic opposition. These things worry me too. But let's get back to the story. And point of fact, it was Diana who first fell foul of the opposition. It happened in the evening on the 15th September, must be 1974 the day after the subject of the opposition had been raised by Tom and he had given the specific instruction, be careful of your electricity. Recalling the circumstances and the event in this recent conversation with me, Diana said, 
Soon after Sigilio's death, I went to a sinning and my own psychic awakening started. I suddenly started seeing auras, thought forms, beings, energies, all that stuff. I'd never seen anything like it before. The attacks started coming with my awakening. I wasn't very experienced or discriminating in this area, and I suppose some of them weren't strictly attacks. I tended to freak out whenever I saw anything, but there was no doubt about the big one. The management had apparently said that the opposition might try to get at the three of them by attacking their loved ones, and had also made a point of telling them to be careful of electricity and using electrical appliances. But at the time, the management was, sh was shit so far as it was concerned, because it was such a short time after Roberta's death. But at that time, the management was shit so far as I'm concerned, because it was a short time after Roberta's death. So I ignored the advice and used the electric iron. After about 20 minutes, I had to stop because there was this crackling in the air and a queer sensation of currents running up my arm. I then began to feel really strange. I told Phyllis and she made me lie down and put cold towels on my neck. Then, all of a sudden, the attack started. There are no words to describe it. It was as if someone was trying to suck my consciousness out of my being. I knew very clearly that that was what was happening that they were trying to possess me, to take me over, and I knew that if I could lie still, I would feel my consciousness being drawn back and come down and out of me. It was a very strange feeling. But I kept making erratic movements. I could pull out of it. Well, John came into the room to see what all the noise was about, and Phyllis told him to stay away from me, not to touch me or else she said they might get you. Phyllis knew what to do. She wanted to get me outside and wrap me around a tree, which was what eventually happened. But at first, when she tried to drag me out, I fought. Then I experienced this click inside my head, this sudden realization that nothing could ever take my consciousness. I was suddenly stronger than whatever it was attacking me. I kept saying, it's okay, it's okay. There I'd been raging and hysterical a few seconds before, and now suddenly I felt calm and everybody around me was freaked out. I said, it's okay, just get me outside. So they took me outside and wrapped me around the tree, and I had to stay there for about an hour. All that time I could feel the negative forces being withheld from me by that tree, and this incredible vibration that was in my body very gradually subsided. Later the same day they held a communication session, which John opened by asking for some explanation of what had happened to Diana. Tom answered, this had been building since the 22nd of your August, 1974. In her weakened condition, the negative forces were able to get through. When a being, whether it be one of you or one of yours, generates a fear or an anger, it, is, it then permits an energy wave. And as we have explained to you before, it was important to be careful with electricity, for this again creates another type of energy which we and also other forces may generate on. Tom went on to say, moreover, it was still dangerous, it was still a dangerous day and they might have to leave suddenly. Not because there's danger for us, but because there's danger for you. But for the present they were holding and John and Andrija could ask questions. Andrija was anxious to follow up a few new topics which Tom had introduced in a communication the previous day. He had led up to it in a roundabout way, and the conclusion came as a surprise to both, both Andrecha and John. Tom said, We know that there is a concern in your mind about the relations between you and the Nine. As you know, I am the spokesman for the Nine, but I also have another position, which I have with you in this project. I will try to give you names so you can then understand in what you work and who we are. I may not pronounce who I am in a manner which you could understand because of the problem in the being's brain, but I will explain so that the doctor perhaps will understand. I am Tom, but I am, but I am also Harmarkus. I am also Harenka. I am also known as Tum, and I am known as Atum. And Rita said, yes, we know something of these names historically, of course. Tom went on. If you understand that, you may understand that what my position is in this situation and this project. We thought before there was light, there was dark, and dark lasted longer than light. 
It is now time for it to be balanced, and this was attempted 5,000 of your years ago and more. And now it is again this time. And this time it must be accomplished, because the planet that you exist on cannot exist many more of your years otherwise. The references to ancient Egyptian civilizations were quite new in the communications, and Andrija was anxious to follow up the topic. So when he was invited to put questions the following day, he said, I'd like to go on with the identifications that you were giving for yourself, Tom, and the other names by which you have known. I was particularly impressed by Harmakut. Could you tell us? Tom did not let him complete the question, but said enigmatically, I am the day, I am the evening, and I am the mid noon. Andre wasn't in the mood to be sidetracked by enigmas, enigmas, however. There was something he wanted to know. How did the Egyptians come to build the Sphinx and name it after you? There was a long pause before Tom said, You have found the secret. He then said he would have to verify whether this information could be disclosed, and after a pause for consultation, he said, The true knowledge of that will be relayed to you another time. But I will say briefly to you concerning the Sphinx, I am the beginning and I am the end. I am the emissary. I am the emissary. Another enigma. Though the word emissary was interesting. Emery, emissary from where? From the nine, presumably. Support for the view that ancient Egyptian law and symbology were so strange that they must have come from another world. Tom now said, Today is a day of danger and we must be very cautious. There are electric impulses in your atmospheric, atmospheric air conditions. We are having interference. You are being probed. We must be guarded to. Andreja had been experiencing a chest irritation for some minutes and he now started coughing convulsively. Tom explained that it was because of the probes. John asked, if it would be advisable to terminate the communication and Tom confirmed that it would be best thing for all concerned that they should send energy to Phyllis as she came out of the trance. On her way out, Phyllis later said she had seen wires like spider webs that were sparking like crazy and also she had seen something that made her urge Andrija to rest. Every time we sit there doing something to you, she said, they're draining you, Andrija, they're wiping you out. And they're doing something to you too, John. He thinks he feels great, but it's a false thing. Looking back on this time was to some looking back on this time some two years later, John wondered how much of what happened was due to suggestion. It was a strange time, with the three of them shut away together at Ostinning for two weeks, for Diana only stayed a few days, and of course there were interpersonal tensions, and, and as they had been told that things were going to be bad until 22nd of October, he wondered whether anticipation might not have played some part in how badly they actually turned out to be. They all suffered depletion of energy, though he did so less than the other two, and Phyllis underwent regular five psychic attacks going into and coming out of trance, at least until they got the Faraday cage. But in retrospect, John sees these weeks as a period when they were drawn inwards upon themselves in order to learn and in order to be strengthened for the work that was to come. He is dubious about the extent to which any cosmic opposition might have been responsible, and for him the concept of the opposition of the others is most meaningful when it is regarded as the negative side of oneself. For so to regard it, he has found, is to have something specific to contend with. It was different for Phyllis, so, for she was the one of them that was most vulnerable, and in her experience, lower psychic manifestations, taking physical forms and producing physical effects, were a reality. The day following the occasion when the communication had been abruptly terminated, she had a curious experience. She was counting down through the levels into deep trance, and when she reached the number 36, she stopped abruptly, fascinated by what she was seeing, I'm getting all sorts of Egyptian pictures and scarabs and everything, she said. What's a scarab represent? And Richard said it's a symbol of the rising sun and of creation and of 
rebirth. Such a lot of energy around, those beings are here, and they're trying to put dots in them. But wait a minute, they had something to do with the Egyptians also. Yes, Andre just said, they were the oppositions, the opponents, the enemy of Horus. They were collectively known as Set. Were they from the sea? We don't really know, but they are symbolized to a great extent by Hippopotamia and the crocodiles, so that may be a clue. They did come up from the river, as I remember the legend. Phyllis went on, I seem to be in a place in a desert, and I feel I'm going down underneath a pyramid. But these fishmen, I'm sorry, that's not right. I'm not supposed to call them that. These men are wearing rubber suits. They come up out of the sea, and what have they to do with doing experiments? They try to do experiments in order to control. Phyllis felt that there was some elusive but important truth to be gained and gleaned, and she said she must go further in. She was just going to count down further when suddenly the Egyptian scenarios was eclipsed and she cried out, Oh Christ, now they are working on my left hand on the side. Can you see what's happening? Oh, the pain. And Richard claimed her left hand was appreciably swollen. They're doing something to me, Phyllis said. Yes, the veins are very distended, Andrita said. They've got a big needle in, Phyllis said, and she cried out with pain. Andrita said, I want you to come out of it right away. And very firmly he brought her back, counting with her through the levels from 36 back to 45. When she was out, Phyllis said she felt as if she had been drunk. She wanted to go back immediately, though, and get an explanation of what had happened from Tom. This time she counted down, urged on by Phil Andrita without pausing. Eventually... Tom announced his presence and in answer to Adventure's request for an explanation of what had just happened said. What was actually done was an implant was placed at the very last moment in this being, Phyllis. It was not of our doing and in coming out, the sensitivity, sensitivity of this channel was aware of those that work with us attempting to remove. It has now been removed. Will you explain to this being that those she were, said were of fish were workers of ours. With a touch of exasperation, Andrew asked if there weren't some way to give warning of potential harassment by the opposition so that Phyllis wouldn't have to go through doubt and agony each time she went into a trance. Tom said, this will pass as we told you. We are in a game of war. We had thought, and you had thought also, that we would have adequate protective devices. But this time they came fast and swift. Remember what you though, that we will never permit any of you three to be taken. We have those that work with us that arrange antidotes and problems will be removed. Be assured of this. The occurrence of Egyptian imagery at the beginning of this session and the fact that Andreja had rec recondite knowledge necessary to answer Phyllis's question might cause us to think that Andreja generated the whole Egyptian scenario that Phyllis experimented in light trance. But if that were the case, we would not expect it. And Tom's explanation of the fishmen to differ. Andrija thought that they Andrija thought they were the opposition, but Tom said they were workers of ours. Also, the pain and swelling in Phyllis's hands were un, un, not anticipated and quite unconnected with the mental imagery she was experiencing. And un, only Tom could explain how the two were linked which would appear to confront us with a choice between accepting Tom's explanation and the pain and swelling, which were undoubtedly genuine, or them to some other cause on regarding Tom as an opportunist, improviser, skilled at accommodating any occurrence with its own crazy scheme of things. Crazy or not, Tom's scheme of things had to be given high marks for consistency. In the same communication, at the above, Andreja referred back to the very first communication with Tom and asked if they might now take up again the subject of early Earth history. Tom showed us an impressive capacity for recall, saying, we spoke at that particular time of a massacre. Andreja hadn't prompted him with this fact. He ignored Andreja's request for information about early history and went on. And you are very much aware that this is what is happening. The massacre will not be in the cosmic, but in the physical planet. 
and because of the problems which the people of this planet have created. We are here to prevent this. This is our third attempt with you in preventing this. This is the third in a series. And this time, because of the three being together, as we told you in our celebration, we know that this will be accomplished. If it will be accomplished, then presumably there will be no massacre. Tom frequently appears to be making definite predictions when in fact he's talking about possibilities, about what is likely to happen unless something is done to prevent it. This is the reference, this is the case with references to the coming ice age, which came up several times in the communications in this period, and which are in fact a variation on the theme of massacre. Within a, within a 200 of your year, year period, Tom said, there will be an ice age on this planet if something is not done. And then the souls who have been trapped on this planet will be forever be trapped. They will not be able to evolve or understand because they will be involved constantly in the desires of the physical. The theme was developed in later communications. We spoke to you about an ice age that is coming and this is something that is occurring because of the illnesses of the human race. And when we say illnesses, we mean of your technology, which has not been refined. This is not something that is being brought to us, to you from outside your planet or by other forces. It is coming about because of the greed and because of the desires of the beings of this planet, because of the pollution in your atmosphere and in your waters, which in turn pollutes your atmosphere so that the sun can then no longer penetrate. With our technology, we will be able to get help rid the earth of the problems that your pollutions and your technology have created. Human greed, desire, jealousy and emotional imbalances are responsible both for the dire situation the planet is in, is in ecologically and for the general cosmic crisis and it, as it would require a fundamental change in human consciousness and orientation to overcome these failings, it is important both for the Earth and for the universe, that such a change be effected. This message, embellished with the warnings about the cunning and power of the opposition, the other forces bent upon preventing the change, is not remarkably original in the context of traditional ideas of apocalypse and the literature of moral exhortation. But there is one rather original aspect to it, which kept coming up in the communications of October. The stress on the fact that the primary need was for balance, and the cosmology related to this idea. The prescription for success and the continuing growth, both in the individual and in the cosmos, is not to beat the devil in a dra dramatic final contest, and thus usher in a new age of sweetness and light but through unremitting efforts to hold in balance conflicting but complementary forces. In answer to a question of Andretus as to what the opposition forces were like, how they operated, and where they came from, Tom said, You ask from where they come, and we know that in your mind you wonder if they are the counterpart of us. Is that not correct? Yes. Andretta said. Tom went on, no, they are not the counterpart of us. We remember this, that we are in the centre and we don't wish to sound as if we are perfect or as if we are egotistical, but on either side of us there is a positive and there is a negative. And when I say this, I mean there is the positive which is not balanced and there is a negative which is not balanced. We are in the centre and we are balanced. We are trying to bring those other forces into balance. Do you understand? They are not the counterpart of us. Andreja confessed that he was still puzzled. We don't understand the nature of these two forces that you are in the centre of, he said. Tom said patiently that he would try to explain in terms that they would understand, though he stressed that the explanation was really inadequate and only a rough analogy. 
You are a physical being and you have a left and a right. And without your left, you would be imbalanced with your right. And without your right, you would be unbalanced with your left. This is the situation. They are part, they are part, but they are not all. And they are not complete. This was profoundly enlightening, but they let the questions rest for the time being. And Richard took it up a few days later, asking how the forces that Tom called positive and negative related to what people on earth considered good and bad. They elicited a long and interesting statement. It is difficult for you in your physical world to truly understand the importance of both, Tom began. I will try to explain. Visualize the universe as a gigantic scale. We are the pivot of this scale. Visualize that on one side of the universe all would be negative and that all on the other side would be positive. And as you see this, you know that there is a complete out-of-balance situation. The universe actually has four sides, and within each of the sides there are many galaxies and solar systems. Now on the other two sides of the universe, from this side, it is a perfect... But on this side, how, many, how may I explain? If you would take a stone for each of the galaxies, and they would be in perfect weights and perfect proportion to those on the other three sides, then this would also be imbalanced. But if one of those stones was a porous substance and you placed it in oil and it absorbed the oil and became weighted with them, then it would upset the balance and pull the scale out of caliber and would upset the other side of the universe. Your planet Earth is accomplishing that. The negative is the heavy oil. Remember, the other sides are balanced. The other sides are balanced. But this imbalance that we have can in turn topple the rest. That seemed fairly lucid, but Tom wasn't entirely happy with his analogy, for he said with a touch of the, re of the resigned weariness that anybody who had struggled to find words for obtuse, obtuse concepts would recognize that it's not quite correct. Then, apparently recalled Andrej's original question, he went on. In actuality, there is no good and there is no bad. It is only when one becomes sour or rotten that it contaminates the rest, whether it be good or bad. We understand that you are now working with us and what we consider the positive forces, Andrej said. But have you ever in the past stepped in to actively aid the negative forces when the positive has been causing the imbalance? Tom said, when the positive has no understanding of the negative, it is out of balance. Without being aware of the negative and being aware that it must be balanced, then that is out of balance. And the answer to your question is yes. That is very important for our understanding, Andrew said. Tom continued. Because of the ignorance of the peoples of your planet and because of their religious leader, leaders who have taught this ignorance, the negative forces, which are not truly, as you see them, manifest in that way in order to instill fear, but what is truly negative, what has created the upset besides the desires and the greeds, is the complete denial of the existence of God. Do you understand? Yes, Andrea said, so this is the greatest thing that has to be readdressed or righted. This is correct, Tom said. And you must explain also to your people the necessity for earth people and for the souls and spirits that surround your earth to release themselves from greed and desire because that is the trap. Your religious leaders do not understand this and they do not teach the people. At the beginning of the communication that contained this discussion which took place on the 8th of October 1974, Tom said that there was a meeting of the council in progress and that while she was out of her body, Phyllis would be taken before the council again to have some things explained to her which she would report to the others when the communication was over. Towards the end of the session, Tom 
politely took leave of John and Agrecha for a short time in order to go and meet with the being. And when he returned, he said that many things had been explained to her and they should have a conversation immediately on her return, for she would remember part of what she had experienced and learned, and other parts of it would be recalled in the conversation. finish this chapter for now here. They are very long chapters. Chapter 5 and I continue in the next upload. I wish you all a good day. Bye bye. Oopsie.